You are listening to the Cycling Podcast, a de Tour de France in association with Rafa, the fastest closing in a world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as a partner EF Education First and Canyon Charam. Stage 10, today with in Albi. Where are we, Lionel? We are in a lovely little square in Gaillac. Do you know the Tour de France's history with Gaillac? You're about to tell us. It's only hosted one start or finish of a Tour de France stage, and that was in 2003, the very memorable time trial from Gaillac to Cap de Couverte. Is that the correct pronunciation, Francois? Cap de Couverte, yeah. Thank you. Uh, where Jan Ulrich beat Lance Armstrong by one minute 36 seconds, uh, which at the time was a real seismic result in the Tour. Um, it didn't derail Armstrong from winning the Tour, though. And we're, what, half an hour away from Albi, where the stage finished this afternoon and where the race will have its rest day tomorrow. The wind is blowing, a, a light breeze now really, but it, the, the wind has been the story of the day, hasn't it? Um, it was windy this morning at the start as we drove down from our beautiful uh, hotel. What was the village called again, Francois, will you remind me? It was La Voute Chillac. Lovely place, yeah. very remote in the mountains. And we drove down to the start in saint Flor. And it was noticeable that as we drove in, not that we were late, but we were certainly, uh, uh, you know, getting there at the, 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 towards the later end of the available time slots to arrive, shall we say. But there were, teams, fashionably there were teams that were behind us. Well, Astana arrived at the same time as us and, and Groupama FTG behind us, behind them rather. And... Um, They were both quite late. They were both cutting it quite fine. And there was a lot of stress around the Astana bus this morning. Omar Friley rode right into me, went over my foot. He almost came off himself. And I was told that it was a lot of stress because they'd been, they were staying two kilometers away and they were told they would get a police escort to the start. That didn't materialize and they had to go the long way around and the riders weren't very mm. happy about it. Now, is it a coincidence that those two teams were the big losers today? Who knows? But a lot happened today, so let's have the tail of the attack, please, Lionel. Okay, Richard, yes. Well, uh, stage 10 from San Fleur to Albi, 217.5 kilometres, and it was a stage win for Wout van Aert, the Belgian sensation riding his first Tour de France for Jumbo Visma. That was his team's fourth stage win of the race after Mike Turnison on the opening day, and then the team time trial, and then Dylan Groenewegen on Friday. But that doesn't tell even a fraction of the stage story. There was a five-man break of Tony Galapan of AG2R, Napniel Berhani of Kofidis, Anthony Turgis of Total Direct Energy, Mads Wurz of Katusha and Odd Christian Eiking of Wanty Goubert. They were joined by Michael Shah of CCC to make it six and so far so predictable on what could and perhaps should have been just a sort of transitional stage taking us gently into the rest day. But the final 75 kilometers were all action with the wind causing first concern and then chaos and the tension really ramped up through the late afternoon as the wind got, uh, well, stronger and, and less predictable or perhaps more predictable for those who were in the know. And in the final 30 kilometres, really all hell broke loose. The first casualty was George Bennett, the Kiwi with Jumbo Visma, lying fourth overall this morning perhaps still reeling from New Zealand's defeat to England in the Cricket World Cup final yesterday. He didn't take that too well, did he? Um, but with 33 kilometres to go, he found himself trapped in a third group on the road after reportedly going back for bottles at his own insistence. Um, we'll maybe dig into that a little bit more in the episode. And then a few kilometres after that, when the six leaders were caught, Team Ineos had come to the front to really pile on the pressure and they forced the decisive splits. Caught out were Thibaut Pino, Jakob Fulsang, Rigoberto Uran, Richie Port and Giulio Ciccone. That group did get to within around 11 or 12 or 13 seconds, depending on reports, with around 15 kilometres to go. But then the bungee rope snapped and the time losses were hugely damaging. Up at the front, Van Aert won the uphill sprint ahead of Viviani, Ewan and Matthews. Also in that group, the significant names were Julian Alaphilippe, the yellow jersey, Geraint Thomas, Egan Bernal, Kreuzwick, Bardet, Quintana, Adam Yates and Dan Martin. And then it was all eyes on the clock. At 1 minute 40 came the group containing Mollema, 
Pino, Uran, Port and Fuglesang. Landa and Ciccone came in at 2.09. Nibali was at 5 minutes and 4, so game definitively over for him. And George Bennett in at 9 minutes 41. So Alaphilippe now leads Thomas by a minute and 12. Bernalis four seconds back. And you would have to say Team Ineos have played an absolute blinder today. Ten days into the race, the rest day tomorrow, we'll count the, uh, the damage and the consequences of the wind blowing. But first, let's hear from a man who had, well, arguably the best seat in the house. Seb PK, the voice of Radio Tour, who is in the director's car just behind, well, all the action that was taking place. Richard spoke to him earlier on this evening. I mean, well, you had a great view of what happened today. Was it... Was it you know, were there signs that there were that this was going to happen, or did it really come out of nowhere? No, you had signs. You had signs for about thirty kilometres before it really happened, uh, because you could feel the teams were moving to the front. You could feel that some of the riders were really struggling at the back, and you could you could feel that the DSs were were telling their riders go to the front, go to the front. There's a side wind, and there's a possibility for echelon. So you could really feel it. I mean at least for 30 kilometers before and then it really happens and i was and it was it was amazing yeah i mean was it a case of was it the strength of the wind that dictated just the the the, the carnage or or was it the identity of the teams that went to the front and really drilled it uh it's a it's a bit of everything i mean you, you don't need to have that much wind it was windy enough uh, and the wind was coming from the right, uh, the right, uh, the right side. It was obviously a, a side wind, so that was perfect. And then obviously, when you have uh, teams like uh, Ineos and De Kooning moving to the front and putting the pressure on, well, then everything explodes. And also, this is the the tenth stage of the Tour de France, so some guys are getting are, are really struggling and are, are getting more and more tired. So um, we 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 hoped it would happen, and it did, which is great for the for the for the show. I mean, you've sat behind the, the the bunch on many stages. Seb, was that about was that as, as thrilling a stage as you've witnessed from that vantage point? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's it's always thr- thrilling. I mean, the the first memory I have of a, of, of, of a national on stage was Saint Amand Moron, a stage won by uh, Mark Cavendish uh, uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, and yeah, it's it's super super exciting because. Um, from my perspective, being in, in the, the um, team, di- the, the director's car number two, I can't really see what's exactly going on. So I try to look at the, the riders in the, in the third group, the riders in the second group, and it's always exciting to find out that suddenly, oh, there's Pino in that group, oh, there's Fuglesang in that group, oh, at the front you have Dan Martin, and you have all the De Koenigs, and you have Bernal. So it's, a, it's always, yeah, it's exciting to see who are in the different groups yeah and i was honestly i was really impressed by one man who uh, was maybe born in, in ghent or in, in anvers and his name was uh, and his name is uh, nairo quintana he, he he impressed me on paris nice and he showed he was a real flandrian once again <laughs> i mean you, you've got the best view of, of the race at the back because the action is really at the back on a on a crosswind stage like today isn't it yeah, it's, well, it's great being at the back. It's also great because uh, once the gaps are more or less established, we move up. So we were behind the, the third group, and we moved to the second group, and then we moved to the yellow jersey group. Uh, as I said, you, you get to see who's in the third group, then you get to see who's in the second group. You start to understand the tactics of the different teams and, and why the, some of the teams are, are riding in the front. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's always a fantastic show, the, the echelons. If only Thibaut Pino had your ability to jump from echelon to echelon. Oh, <laughs> in, 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 indeed. I, I, was, I find it pretty, pretty interesting because... Um, <laughs> Thibaut Pino was interviewed at the start, at the finish by a, a colleague from France Television, and, and the question was absolutely brilliant. The question was, uh, "So you had a bad day?" And Thibaut went, <laughs> and he turned around and went. The fastest closing in a world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as a partner EF Education First and Canyon Charam. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa, our headline sponsor. Look out for the EF Gone Racing films from the Tour de France, behind the scenes with EF Education First. 
And uh, if you want to be a Peddler de Charme, then you can become one by buying a, a Rafa Peddler de Charme t-shirt or cycling jersey or casquette. And uh, I think at this tour, I've been more aware of people sending us pictures or posting them on social media of them wearing their Peddler de Charme cycling podcast uh, gear. So uh, by purchasing that range of clothing, you are helping to support the podcast. So thank you very much. In you know, psychologically boosting our morale, but also financially as well. So thank you very much, and thanks to Rafa. Um, so uh, we heard from Seb PK just before the break. There some fascinating thoughts from him. You know, there, there, there was no surprise about what happened in the sense that the wind was blowing pretty strong, and in conditions like that, you know, you're going to get teams like, in particular, De Kuhn and Quick Step, Bora Hansgrove would put in that category now as well. And Team Ineos, who obviously have the goal of protecting their two leaders, who were both up there. Um, and there were losers as well. The big losers were Jakob Fulsang and Thibaut Pino. And I mentioned the fact that both teams were quite late to the start. <clears throat> who knows whether that was significant. But, Francois, you um, spoke, I think, to Yvon Madio, one of the sports directors yeah. at, at, at FTJ. Yeah, exactly. I, we were making quite of a you know a summary of the the first week of the tour. He said, "Why well, I was saying so far so good. We didn't make any mistake." And I, I told and I and before I left him, I said, "And oh, uh, what about today? What, what, what's the wind like?" And he said, "Oh, the wind is ba- you know backwind for two thirds of the race and then crosswind in the in the last third. So we must be cautious." So they knew what was going to happen. And the funny thing is, uh, Julien Alaphilippe at the finish, he said exactly the same. He said everybody knew there would be crosswinds. Uh, at exactly where the question would take place, we knew it would take uh, happen 35 k's from the from the finish. So everybody was warned. So what happened was, uh, and th- that's what he said. Uh, he said the Conning Quick Step didn't try to create an echelon, and I don't think Timinios either tried to create an echelon. They, they, it was only a matter of a positioning, and because of the strength of the teams, if you uh, apart from Hugo Visma, well, apart from George Bennett, who, who, who in my opinion, uh, well, you know really lost it today because actually I mean Bubo Visma played it well they won the stage but apart from that, that little hiccup in the in the Jumbo Visma team I mean all the strongest teams in, in terms of cohesion that were there uh, at the front and, I, and I'm thinking the kind of quick step will launch the move around Scrove like we know, know how tight a team they are uh, even Team Sunweb were, was there with Matthews and of course Team Ineos because cohesion is one of their strengths Lack of cohesion, probably lack of good positioning from uh, from uh, Groupama FGJ meant they knowing what was going to happen, they couldn't do anything about it. Pino was not so badly placed when uh, the, the the split uh, took place, but with only William Bonnet and Stefan Kung, you, you, well, you, you could say th- these guys are great riders and it should be enough, but. It, it wasn't enough to avoid the split, and, and as we're going to see and discuss, uh, it was not I- enough either to chase uh, when the split took place, because, I mean, uh, we discussed it with Lionel in the car. Uh, the, the way they handled the chase was probably not adequate either. Yeah, I mean, my uh, contention is that they sort of panicked a bit. I mean, they had they did have another 15 kilometers to bring that in. Um, they, they, they got very close, the, the job was to get back on before the finish. I mean, that was the job, and they failed to execute that. I know we can... It's easy for me to say, sitting here, armchair um, sports director or armchair cyclist, well, they should have just maybe kept cool a little bit. Richard, you, you made the point, and it's a completely valid point, that when you're behind, you want to get back on terms as quickly as possible, because then once you're in the, in the wheels... Ineos then would go well they're all back on so there's no point absolutely drilling it now or they you know it might ease the pace at the front a little bit I completely get that but they did have a bit more time to to get back on I mean they 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 didn't judge the effort over the distance that was available and that was the only job they had to do yeah but I I disagree with you there completely I think you have to in that situation you have to close it as quickly as you can because as long as there's a gap and it closed today to 11 seconds you know they could they could almost reach out and touch them but as long as there's a gap the the front group um has this momentum and this huge psychological advantage they're throwing coal on the fire they're they're you know they're they're gaining by working whereas the the psychology of chasing is very very different and for as long as that's the case i think there's this momentum that builds in the front group 
and it becomes harder and harder for the group behind to close the gap. And I yeah. think that, that in any echelon racing, the you have to close the gap as quickly as you possibly can. It's why you sometimes see guys trying to jump across. Yeah, but one thing supporting Lionel as uh, you know opinion on this on on the matter is uh, that it was like uh, <laughs> it was like the fireworks last night for Bastille Day in a way uh, when, when you got all these things popping up all, all over the place. And the, the 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 main the most important moment in that echelon was when actually the second group, the Pinot group, came back within 11 seconds of, of the of the main uh, peloton. And all of all of a sudden, it all cracks. William Bonnet who was with the with the uh, Pino. It, it, it totally, uh, you know, uh, crack, uh, cracked at, at, at that very moment. There were, there were, I think, two Astana riders with Jakob Fuglsang. They also uh, suddenly, you know, uh, well, they just couldn't do uh, do anything anymore. And we saw Pino and Fuglsang chasing themselves. And that's when it was dead. You know, uh, that, that's the very moment when the 11 seconds we kept. We, we, Quickly, in a matter of a 1K, became 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and that's finished. So and then maybe yeah. at the pace, their, their 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 effort just a little bit differently, they might have done it. Well, they went too hard on the hill. They killed everyone on the hill. And and it, had they got over that hill, and again, easy for me to say, sitting looking at the the printed profile, but even watching the on the, on the run in and the roads to the finish, they really needed to just hold it together and 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 buy in a bit of cooperation and and say you know let's let's try and you know they were so close and they i think with a with a a, a slightly more cool-blooded approach they possibly could have got back on terms but i completely accept what you're saying rich they 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 didn't want to be that with the gap between them and the, uh, the front group and of course while the gap is open the 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 momentum and the incentive is totally with the front group. Um, very, very easy for the chasers. Once it's down to like Pino and Fuglsang chasing themselves, the game really was up by that point. But perhaps they should have just, yeah, somebody should have just said, well, hang on a minute, if we can just get over this hill and then treat the last six, 15, 16 kilometres as, as a separate job, I rope think, in a bit of help I and think get back in on the, terms. In the end, yes, that would have been a, a better strategy, but I think it would have still been damage limitation. I think what they did was they they, they tried to, to, to close the gap. They tried to get back on terms, and then trying to do so blew up completely. Yeah. So in hindsight, yeah, they'd have been better off you know, managing the resources better and accepting that they were going to lose a bit of time. But I think in those situations, you do panic. Um, anybody panics, and... It's, it's what makes you know bike racing so interesting. Th this may have cost Full Sang and Pino the tour today. They may be stronger in the high mountains, but they've lost the tour today, perhaps on a day where it's all about positioning and 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 team. As you mentioned, team cohesion. Francois well, having Francois made the point at La Planche de Belfi about how hard won those seconds were mm. for on on you know um, on a climb like that. In the big mountains, it's even harder to crack people, isn't it? I mean, they either they either crack spectacularly and are out of the picture completely, or they it's it's like teasing out well, a few seconds. We don't expect the margins in. to be that no. big. Yeah. So to, to to throw away a minute yeah. and forty like that is. So I mean, they would had they just had that moment of clarity. Okay, thirty seconds, not ideal, but let's just get in as yeah. quickly as we can. They, they, they rush of blood, the, the, the insistence on closing the gap, rather than limiting losses, really, and and and. You know that that really has been very costly for them. Mm. Losing the tour today, to, in my opinion, is probably a, a little bit exaggerated because if you take Pino, it, it took 30 seconds of the other favourite the other day, lost 140 this day uh, today. That's so, so that's 110. It, it might might look uh, a, lo a lot, but it, it looks he lo it lost 110 on who? You know, he lost 110 mainly on the on on Bernal and uh, Garen Thomas. Which, which, which it's, it's funny the way we discuss uh, the the position. And the way the positions were discussed during the echelon uh, implied that al already we had ma made our own hierarchy of the tour and and what the GC w w was meant to, to to look at the finish because we because for us obviously w when we mentioned these guys uh, it. It, even th even though we, th we we seem to believe that the first week didn't you know it, well, it was not really that important the well, I mean every everything will ha happen in the third week. 
in, in, in this case, we, we, we're discussing Bernal, Thomas, Pino, Fuglzong, and maybe Uran, and, and, and a little bit Quintana. We've already decided that these six guys would win, one of these six guys would win the tour. And, and, and these little things, team time trial, uh, uh, La Plange et Belfi, uh, uh, the, the Pino, Ala Philippe Raid, and today's Echelon, they, 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 they might not look like very important. We'll see in the end what importance they have. But they, they already managed to kind of sort out the men from the boys, and there's only like uh, five or six guys left in contention. Yeah, but you're talking about the defending champion and Egan Bernal, who we we all kind of agreed was sure. on paper the potential, sure. and it's one minute forty. I mean, h how hard do you have to work to make one minute forty on a on a mountain top finish? I mean, uh, and just to to see that time go away on a day like today. Sure. No, I mean, well, what I'm saying, I mean. Uh, The, the funny thing is, once again, we, we knew and we said, and we maybe we didn't say it as bluntly as we should because we're cautious and it was the beginning of the tour, but in at the back of our mind, every one of us, every single journalist in the press room, had a number one favorite Bernard, number two favorite Garen Thomas, and then who else on the podium? Probably Fuglzong. During the first week of the tour, Pinot had replaced Fuglzong because Fuglzong crashed. But... but, but The, these uh, today, you know, before the just before the first rest day. I mean, this this idea, this you know, conception, preconception we had at the start, got got confirmed. We have two favorite, two guys who didn't make any mistake, because even Quintana lost a little bit of time in the, in the team time trial and in other instances. But these are the two favorites for the two more than ever. And behind the 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 the, 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 the real interesting fight, again, almost as usual, is who will be third. <laughs> Well, we always focus on the losses, don't we, in these situations. But let's give credit to Team Ineos for the way they rode. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the bucking bronco of riding in, uh, in, in the crosswinds like that, they really they, they got aboard and they held on tight and they, they, they made it happen, didn't they? And they, uh, for Thomas and Bernal to have Luke Rowe and Janny Moscon in their corner, um, I mean, they, they didn't put a foot wrong. And Dylan Van Barler as well, and Michel, to be fair. And Michel Kwiatkowski. I mean, look yeah. at the team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. but, but <laughs> so, they were, that, yeah. was, that so, was a real supreme... Seb Peaky mentioned Pyrenees. You know, Quintana, yeah, rode, rode very well. Bernal as well. <clears throat> Two guys you maybe don't expect to be up there in that front echelon. But Luke Rowe, again, the sort of... Uh, Uh, orchestra, orchestra conductor, wasn't it? He was, he was, he was instrumental. Marcus Burghardt was was very strong for Bora Hansgrohe, Daniel Loss, you know, and then Casper Askren, Eve Lampard, and all these guys for the Quick Quickstep as well. There were some real big engines up there. Um, let's hear a bit from Garrett Thomas, though, who also you know came through. We saw Garrett Thomas and Julian Alaphilippe both driving it too on the front. Here's what Garrett Thomas, one of the day's big winners, had to say at the finish. Garrett, is, is the word for that exhilarating? Uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I couldn't think of anything better. But uh, no, yeah, really good day, I guess. In the end, um, you know, we had a little go a bit earlier, but it wasn't really the right conditions. And then. You know, we, EF had a little go and then quick step and we we're just always attentive and ready for anything. And uh, yeah, really good, good day in the end, yeah. And I guess the key was that everyone in that front group was very committed, weren't they? There were a lot of guys there working pretty hard. Yeah, obviously, from our point of view, we had everyone bar um, two guys. So we all just committed. And then, um, I can't even remember, like Bora were, were there. And there was plenty of guys anyway turning and, um, you know, behind could tell they went full especially on the climb to try and close it and then because they didn't then I think they just like ran out of gas and then that's when the, the elastic snapped then and we got uh, such a big a big gap he knows lost over a minute full saying has as well it's a huge blow you've landed today isn't it yeah especially on a day like today where um, you'd never expect it really you know I think it's just a positioning error from them and uh, yeah they lose over a minute and a half so uh, they're great from our point of view Uh, surprised so many missed out I guess and uh, yeah like I said I think they committed full um, to try and close it as quickly as possible and then when they didn't manage that by the top of the climb then we just had you know numbers and kept turning and that's when the elastic snapped and we really gained a bit of time shoot uh, shoot at du peloton cycling podcast team car the back of the pack please well you'll be familiar with the voice of Seb Piquet the voice of Radio Tour the literally in the driving seat of the Tour de France to remind us to tell you that this episode of the cycling podcast is sponsored by our friends at beer52.com 
You can try a case of Beer 52's beers by paying just a £4.95 delivery charge. You get eight incredible craft beers, a copy of Ferment magazine and a snack delivered to your door. And this month's beers are coming all the way from the USA, uh, from Boston in particular. Some of the greatest breweries in America come from Boston in uh, the northeast. Um, included in the collection are Harpoon's Take 5 Session IPA. That's That sounds like the one for me. Clown Shoes. No, that sounds like the one for me. Uh, Galactica Double IPA and UFO. That sounds like the one for you, Richard. Oh. Extraterrestrial. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can mix and match. If you don't like darker beers, you could choose just the lighter ones. And if you don't like lighter ones, choose the darker ones. There's no minimum commitment. You can just take your free case and cancel at any time you want. Um, go to beer52.com slash cycling. That's beer52.com slash cycling. We mentioned the uh, Nairo Quintana, a good day for Quintana, a very bad day for his teammate Mika Landa, who uh, had a pretty nasty crash when he was he was well positioned. Um, there was a, it seemed to be that the uh, Warren Barguil maybe just touched Julian Alaphilippe's wheel, lost control himself, did very well to not to fall off, but in doing so, took out Mika Landa, who crashed at the side. I didn't see him at the finish, but. Um, it looked nasty from the the footage. Um, yeah, no, it and didn't come. Out, it didn't come out of the bus. I spent, you know, most of my uh, you know, the, 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 after the finish. I spent like twenty minutes at the Movistar bus waiting for Londa. He, ne- he never came out and said he would only talk tomorrow at the press conference on rest day. So obviously a little bit of damage there. And and uh, it's a shame for Movistar. They, they they rode like one of the big teams and they really learned to. I mean, remember the day when we were in. Uh, uh, you know, in 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 in, in Holland, in these uh, on the on those polders uh, at the start of the tour a couple of years back, when uh, Quintana lost, well, uh, I think exactly 140, 150 uh, in an echelon. They've learned that that uh, you know how to ride in echelons. And unfortunately for Landa, you know, it crashed at the at the worst possible time. Quintana is looking good, but you know, one of the one of the, the one of the pre-race favourites, Jakob Fulsang. Um, a bad day for him and I was surprised at that we were talking this morning or last night I think about how quiet Astana have been you know one of the the teams we've not seen going in any breakaways despite having riders like Omar Friley Magnus Court who could win stages Um, and my suspicion was they were you know really keeping their powder dry for the high mountains but I would have expected and Luis Leon Sanchez riders like that I would have expected them to have coped a lot better today with the conditions and and with what happened when Fulsang was distanced Uh, I spoke to their sports director Lars Michelson at the finish here's what he had to say well you know uh, I know the teammates did what they could and uh, yeah but it's racing and I think they brought it back to like 10 seconds or even less but then they exploded well he was not the only one losing time was he from the GC so uh, let's see let's take it easy and see what happens there's there's a few stages left to try to make it up if he had been up in the right position he would have been in the first group of course so so I think he's unhappy himself Mm -hmm. I mean if you're up there you don't lose time now he was not up there now he's losing time so yeah as I said before we focus on the people who've lost time but uh, really the story is the people who didn't lose time I mean Stephen Krausweich was in that front group a very good ride by him uh, uh, Emmanuel Buchmann was in there for Bora Hansgrohe Enrique Mass was in there for De Kerning Quickstep obviously had the benefit of you know following his teammates Alaphilippe and Viviani who were, were clearly going to be in that front split but the two names that kind of not surprised me but riders that you would think might be slightly vulnerable in terrain like this Adam Yates and Dan Martin and we've seen Dan Martin caught out in similar situations in the tour before but I wonder how significant it is that Adam Yates had um, Matteo Trentin up there trying to you know get into the split in order to, to contest for the stage I mean he was eighth in the end and Dan Martin had Jasper Philipson who was sixth in the end you know really handy teammates and wheels to follow um, when the, the, the split started to happen and they were they were on the right side of them where yeah, as but where were they? Little. Where were they? La Planche de Belfi, you know, Kreuzweg and Dan Martin. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's really uh, in a first week like this, you know, it's so unpredictable. It's really down to really adapt uh, at the at, at the at the 
you know, the end moment to the si to the situation. This day, as well, they were on the right side of the situation. Kreuzweig, we're not surprised. I mean, he knows how to ride in echelons. Dan Martin, I, I agree. And uh, Adam, Adam Yates, I, 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 you know, I think the Mitchell Don Scott in the last couple of years had have also you know stage echelons themselves. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Dan Martin is, might, might be the the surprising one there. A quick mention of uh, uh, Enric Mas because we, 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 you know, he's someone that, that's not fancied but uh, uh, every day since uh, uh, Julian, Alaphilippe, uh, Julian Alaphilippe was in the, uh, uh, in the yellow jersey the, the, the last man with uh, Julian Alaphilippe on all terrains for the past six days was Enric Mas he's always been riding on the front we know what he did in Walter last year uh, he's, a, he's a young rider with lots of potential he's, he's actually even if the, the kind of quick step I'm not saying it he is their real GC Lira so uh, you know uh, a little penny on the <laughs> on, on the, not an underdog on a, a, a guy who could you know finish in the top 15 if, or even better well second in the Vuelta last year and won a stage of course he well he was going like a bag of washing in the Tour de Suisse just before the Tour de France certainly looked to me I mean he got up the road one day but didn't look uh, convincing at all has been completely overshadowed by teammates this week but now six overall before we've really climbed anything more significant than La Planche de Belfi. So, um, yeah, as we go into that first rest day, uh, De Kerning Quickstep have got the yellow jersey, but they've also got their better GC hope extremely well placed. The cycling podcast at the 2019 Tour de France is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for supporting Cycling Podcast. You can get 25% off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. SISCP25. Um, little shout out for our show that we're doing in Harrogate at the World Championships on the Friday evening. Um, go to the cyclingpodcast.com live events uh, the tab down the side live events and uh, you can uh, get tickets there for that show where Francois will join us it'll be myself Lionel Daniel Freep and perhaps a special guest too um, talks are ongoing uh, any other business from today today's dramatic stage I know we're close to rest day Lionel when you start talking about bags of washing um, <laughs> uh, well, I already did my washing a few days ago. Mm. Um, and there's a washing machine in our Airbnb this evening, which Francois was delighted to yep. discover. Just need to get some washing powder. That's the problem. I mean, you, you, you know, in case of emergency, we've all, we've all done it. Uh, washing our uh, laundry without any washing powder, which is better than nothing. You say we've all done it. <laughs> I've never done that. No, never You've never eaten uh, cold spaghetti either, you know, when you didn't have any... <laughs> You know, when the gas and power was cut off. I mean, you never were a student. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely use uh, washing powder. Um, but we'll, we'll go on the hunt for that. Tomorrow is a rest day. And it's funny, isn't it? Because the complexion of the race seems different after today. We were mm. heading into the rest day serenely, uh, sort of mouths watering at the prospect of how the race might unfold over the next week or so. Because... It seems so open, so so finely balanced, so well poised, really. And and now, I mean, maybe as Francois in his in his you know typically blunt way no. says that, that that all we've got is confirmation of what we expect at the start. But you always hope, don't you? And you always certainly course, hope for yeah. a, a race with lots of w lots one of one thing that we 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 haven't seen. And I was talking this morning to a couple of the team directors, you know, like the chit chat outside of the bus, chit chat, nothing worth recording, or the things that they wouldn't tell you if you if you had a microphone and they were all saying you know like i told him yeah well i heard that you know it, it's the the mo most relaxed first week of the tour uh for for the last decade or something that's what a, some some writers said and they say oh beware it's not the case at all uh, uh they, they all said that the, the way the course was designed was actually to wear out uh the uh, riders in in very different kind of exercise you have the team time trial which is uh, which is hard on cardio and 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 you know in intense then you've got la planche but if you uh, even if it's not you know 
the, the high mountain stage. It's 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 you know they, they had to change gear, to change bikes, to change type of efforts almost every day. Today uh, in the wind, uh, the day before, I mean the, the stage with Saint Etienne with you know always up and down. And really, I can tell you, well, that's what all of the guys were saying, uh, especially with the rest. They've been pushed you know back one day that they're, they're all uh, getting to the rest day with with a lot of relief because and, and it might not seem obvious but uh, they're already tired very well tired. i mean seb made that that point as well which again you know he's got the the best view, well, he, he's looking at the back of the bunch and and that's in many ways the best vantage point he can see uh, certainly on a day like today um the what, how the splits happen it's when just somebody loses a wheel because they're they're tired they're fatigued and with the an extra day of racing before the rest day you know that 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 might have been just a little factor today yeah and although we are kind of looking at the result now thinking well thomas and bernal are second and third overall already having at least pino ahead of them um gave that little bit of doubt but it still might be it still might be unpredictable from course, here on yeah, in well, um, hopefully the, the, yeah. but the, the thing we learned today is that no matter what you know Ineos riders they can fall in a pile of dung and still come out eating strawberries I don't know quite how they do it but they they it's all you know everyone else has lost something somewhere today a, apart from Ineos and arguably yeah, don't, don't forget you know the Giro when uh, Garen Thomas were their leader a couple of years back it, it can it can I, I don't wish for that, but from time to time it can go all it can go wrong. You can crash. Can so you know uh, confirmation, of course. But we all hope not that Ineos you know fade out for the wrong reasons. But we we hope for a little bit more competition. And I think that uh, Pino losing time today and the way he did, he did lose time was probably a sound warning from him. It, it's better. Uh, uh, in a bizarre way, it's better for him to to lose time now than 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 uh, you know crash completely uh, in the mountains later on. I, I guess uh, maybe uh, maybe the, the the great first week he had so far, uh, the, the kind of uh, re, uh, you know lost a little bit of their uh, attention and and uh, and. Uh, and probably there, 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 there was a kind of overconfidence, you know. They, 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 they thought, oh well, you know, we've been doing everything right the first time in many years, and and so and so, yeah, you know, off guard. You should never. I mean, that, that's probably the, the, the mistake. Team Ineos also Team Sky in the past never did. Never ever lose your concentration for one second. And we saw the other day, you know, even when Garrett Thomas crashed, um, the damage was minimal because of the way they they were organised and were able to support him to get back up to the group not getting back on his bike in the first place and then it was well drilled and you know for what might have been a catastrophic incident nothing was really lost in the grand scheme of things and you know today it, it wasn't Pino that lost the wheel you know Pino's form is, is obviously amazing mm -hmm. he's going really well he, he didn't have a bad day physically somebody up ahead of him lost the wheel of and it's somebody else's mm, fault of course. and, yeah, and yeah. so he's paying a very heavy price for something that you know physically he's the same rider that he was yesterday but wow, in the positioning isn't it i mean that's the, the hard it thing be, I mean, but, it, but the split might you know might be the 30th rider or the 35th rider you can still be in the top 50 and be caught in that situation yeah now okay you can argue well he should be in the top 30 but well especially when you know that it's going to happen when when especially when you know that it's going to be crosswinds 35 case which raises the question we have to to talk about the even quickly what Ah, I was about to say some, you know, to be to swear, but what the heck <laughs> happened to George Bennett? What did he do? I mean, well, the the story we heard was that he had insisted on going back for bottles himself. I mean, if that's the case, well, I mean surprising yeah we were all fencing you know uh, even if it was you know uh, looking far ahead and and there would have been lots of conditions but to have a, you know the, 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 the first new Zealander in the yellow jersey well he was he you was know close he, wasn't he and once, yeah. you know if, if Alaphilippe fell away on one of these big climbs and Bennett was in pole position really to take the yellow jersey so yeah huge missed opportunity and he'll be he'll be kicking himself tonight um, because it sounds, in, in his case, like there was a, an error there, a clear error. But anyway, we'll maybe catch up with him and find out exactly what went on. Um, you know, he came into this tour to support Stephen Kreuzberg first and foremost, mm -hmm. I guess. So 
for Jumbo Visma, I don't think it was a bad day. No, <laughs> hardly no, mentioned Wout van no. Aert. I mean, he's oh. been he's been promising uh, this, hasn't he? And he he beat some. The the look on Viviani's face as he crossed the line was just, you know, one of surprise. But Jumbo Visma have won three sprint stages with three different Riders, sprinters, yeah. which is incredible. Oh, I've got a stat here. Uh, has that been done before? Yeah, uh, the, well, what's been done before is actually a, a, a Dutch team won, fi- won five stages with, with four different riders. Uh, Super Confex? In, uh, no. Uh, in, in the, the only once uh, did it happen, recently, or the last time it happened actually, in the first ten stages of the tour, was in 1982. Uh, uh, TI Rally? TI Rally. They won the team time trial and they won... Uh, four stages with different with four different uh, riders so it's yeah, happened but before. I mean the teams had ten <laughs> riders each and there's only about ten teams in the race in those that, days so yeah, I mean and, and yeah, riders were, 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 were kind of dominating the field especially in the early stages of the tour yeah. still you know it's been done before not bad not bad mm. Any other business from tonight? Oh, how could I forget? Well, we nearly did forget. We nearly, having got almost through to the first rest day, outside the team bus almost didn't happen today. Um, (laughs) (laughs) A couple of days ago in our hotel, the Cofidis um, Press uh, officer, Antoine, was was, uh, in our hotel and he approached us and said, oh, are you you recording a podcast? And we explained who we were and he said, oh, we'd love to, uh, you know, do more with you. We're going to be a world tour next year, Cofidis. This. Um, so they were offering the moon on a stick and so I said well yeah I'd like to talk to Napnel Berhani the Eritrean champion sure come to the bus okay what about in a couple of days time no problem so I went to the bus this morning and first of all I was told that uh, Berhani who had a crash a couple of days ago and has got a, a bandage on uh, his right knee I think was having a little bit of extra physio just to make sure he was ready for the stage no problem then it was well he'll talk to you after he's come back from sign on no problem then when he came back from sign on he darted very quickly into the bus and I thought well I'm not going to push it here um, then when we got in the car Richard you said I, I, it was very coffer disappointing wasn't it <laughs> it was coffer <laughs> disappointing um, but when we got in the car you said Behani is in the early break <laughs> and he was out in front for you know two thirds of three you know three quarters of the day um, so well I wanted to speak to him at the finish but because coffee is staying in Albi you fell a pile of dung and came up <laughs> eating strawberries didn't you Lionel today I didn't I came up with a mouthful of dung and straw um, so coffee was staying in Albi so although their bus was at the finish their riders had just gone straight to the hotel no luck there so fortunately I did uh, manage to speak to somebody else outside their team bus outside the team bus with Oliver Narsen AG2R La Mondiale I think everybody was anticipating problems with the wind. Uh, problems, opportunities, let's call them opportunities. Because uh, we had a tailwind for, I think, 150k and then 70k side, uh, side winds. So then everybody knows you have to be in the front and uh, there's, not, there's no place in the front for everybody. You spin out, you're riding 70, 80k's an hour and splits happen. So where were you in, when it was all starting to split up? And more crucially, where was Roman Bardet? He was on my wheel with uh, Cheryl. We were, we were, the three of us were like in... 15, 20th position where we were, where we were actually since that point where, where the side went started because we knew we know, we know where we had to be and it's kind of, we have a lot of confidence in, in those situations. It's uh, something I, I I love doing very much and I uh, I don't think I've ever missed an, an echelon and I wasn't planning on doing that today. Is a crosswind the same wherever you are? Is the crosswinds here the same as in Flanders? Oh no 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 no! There's plenty of crosswinds. There are rules for that. In Flanders and in France, you need in France, to the France, you need like 25, 30 k's an hour winds. In Qatar, you need 15 k's an hour. In Belgium, you need 20 k's an hour. You need uh, long straights, uh, open fields, and then uh, magic can happen. And in terms of uh, Roman Bardet, he was very harsh on himself after La Planche de Belfi, the comments he made. Uh, to gain some time, not on everybody, but on some people, must be uh, you know, a boost to morale, not just for him, but for the team. I think, so, especially for his morale and his mental state, it's important. I mean, what's he like in the team this year? Does he have the same kind of confidence as, as uh, in previous years? Uh, before the start, I'd say yes, after Planche de Belfi. That cracked him a bit, I think, but now it's coming back. I, th- I feel like now there's there's a good amb- ambience in the, in, the, in the bus the last days, and uh, I hope it keeps getting better. 
And lastly, you were in the break the other day and you were trying to go across to that move. Just describe how hard that was and, and, and how close to making it did you get? I think we were... The closest was like five seconds, I think. That's all out there. You, you, give, you give what you have and if you make it, you can win. If you don't, you don't. And unfortunately, it was the latter for me. <laughs> Is it a bit like having the door closed slowly in your face? <laughs> yeah, but really slowly, yeah, because it, I believed in it until uh, 1K to go and... Uh, uh, Unfortunately, <laughs> I had to stop believing then. <laughs> oh, well, Oliver Nassen, AG2R Le Mondial there. Now, uh, <laughs> teammate of uh, Roman Bardet, uh, uh, you know, a master of these crosswind stages. Uh, a very, a very good, sort of, I think, still underrated rider. Mm. So well, interesting to hear from him. Interesting to day. hear his different take on how crosswinds are different in different countries and also the fact that Bardet's confidence is returning. And uh, although he didn't gain on everybody, he did gain on some people today um, and looking upwards rather than downwards. Just before we go, um, Kilometer Zero, sponsored by Hans Grohe. Uh, well, episode six came out today. That was part two of Lionel's conversation with David Walsh about the 19... 19- 99 Tour de France, the first of Lance Armstrong's wins. Fascinating that was uh, too. Tomorrow's episode is about the press officers. Uh, kind of a new job in, in professional cycling. When I started 15 years ago or so, there may be one or two press officers. All the teams now have at least one press officer. So we've spoken to quite a few of them and uh, that episode will come out tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much to Hans Grohe for enabling us to make the morning episodes of Kilometer Zero. Much more to come. And before we go, uh, a reminder that you can uh, stand a chance of winning the folding bike, the Austin Cycles Atto, which I've been darting around on this morning, exploring our lovely uh, village. And I, uh, you can win that if you enter our competition. Sign up to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com. Um, in the newsletter, there's a, a, a link to click and you can leave your name and the reason why you should win the bike. So go for it. So before we go, I must say thank you to some more friends of the podcast. Thank you very much for supporting us uh, by signing up at thecyclingpodcast.com. Thanks to Michael Hart, Laurel Odiber, Ralph Percival. Oh. You know Laurel? Well, I, I know, know Laurel. Laurel. Nice yeah. guy. Hi, Laurel. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Laurel. And thanks again, Laurel. Uh, Danny Murphy... Alex Gidley and Antonio Jose Mateo Cabrera. And a big thank you to Lee Jackson, Jack Waters, Andrew Broadway, Jonathan Deering, Gareth Downs, and George Patelopoulos. And thank you to Stephen Carr, Philip Lennon, Jake Hollins, and Phil Ransom. And also a big thank you to friend of the podcast Luke and his dad Chris Williams who are both currently in hospital in uh, Switzerland with broken femurs sustained in the same accident just two hours into their annual Alpine cycling holiday that's real terrible luck and I hope that uh, you are both on the mend as quickly as possible Um, Darren and Luan say that the podcast is the only thing keeping them chipper at the moment so um, get well soon and thanks for listening